Well, good morning once again. It's good to be able to share this time together once again today, and we give you a very warm welcome to this time of shared worship. Uh, as you can see, we're still online. We're still recording this in the empty space that we once called church. But as this has become the norm for us over the past 10 or 11 months, so we're also, I hope, realising that this isn't the church, but you are sitting there scattered among the streets and roads and avenues and crofts and ways and closes of Litchfield and beyond, and indeed way, way beyond for some of you. What unites us is less the fact that we once shared this building together, but that we share the call and commission of God to love one another and to love his world. And in these regular opportunities for shared screen time, we're also able to offer our worship together to the God who calls us his people. So please, whoever you are and wherever you are this morning, join us as part of God's worldwide church in praising him, praying to him and listening to him. If you've got children and young people with you, uh, there are some things for them to do on their Facebook pages. And uh, we're very grateful to one of our younger members, Esther, this morning, who's going to get us started with some words from Psalm 72. So over to you, Esther. Praise the Lord, our God. He does such amazing things. Praise his glorious name forever. Let his glory fill the whole world. Amen and amen. Well, thank you so much for that, Esther. That was great. Good to see you this morning. Uh, and Esther isn't the only one who will be helping us uh, today. Our music's going to be led by Mark and Sam Tranchant. And as they give a lead from their home on Bowley Park, please feel free to join in wherever you are and sing along with the words on the screen as uh, we begin with a song of, of praise and adoration by Jared Cooper, King of Kings, Majesty. I 
So as always, thank you very much for that, uh, Mark and Sam. Wherever we've been this week, there will have been something to thank God for. Many of you have enjoyed the snow and periods of sunshine, no doubt. Some have been celebrating birthdays and other events, and some of you have sent in your videos and photos and messages uh, to share with the rest of us. So let's encourage each other by looking at those now. Thank you for my new friend, the snowman. Well, many thanks for, for all those items. Good to see what's been going on. Please keep sending them in each week. Uh, there are those who are really cheered up by seeing other members of the congregation doing uh, things like that. But let's now offer our thanks to God for all that he continues to do for us and indeed for who he is. So let us pray. Almighty God, creator, sustainer and hope of us all, We've seen your creative beauty in our world this week, as we've seen our gardens and the countryside blanketed in snow under the glorious blue of a sunny winter sky. We praise you for all that you have made and for all that you do to watch over and provide for it. Thank you for your constant presence with us when we're full of joy and excitement, as well as when we're feeling fragile and vulnerable. Thank you for all that Jesus has done to bring us close to you and for the things he teaches us about how to get the best out of life. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who lives within us and provides us with the inspiration, energy and abilities we need to worship, work and witness for you. Whatever our situation and our mood today, you are the same God, always there for us and always ready to help. 
So we offer you our praise and thanks. Some of us as we rejoice in all that's going on in our situations. Some of us as we struggle with what life is throwing at us just now. As we worship together, may we all hear your voice and know your presence. And may this time with you prepare us for whatever lies in store in the week ahead. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. And join me if you would like to as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So let's continue to acknowledge God's amazing love for us as Mark and Sam lead us once again in Thomas Chisholm's great song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Many thanks for that music, uh, Mark and Sam. We're going to hear a, a passage from the New Testament now, from Paul's letter to the Colossians. And we're going over to North Litchfield, where Meg is waiting to read for us from Colossians chapter 1, going into verse 2. Over to you, Meg. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, through to Colossians 2, verse 5. 
Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ Jesus is. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of this word. Amen. Thanks very much for that, Meg. Now, before we reflect on what Paul has to say in those words and what God might be saying to us through them, let's pray. Loving God, open our ears to hear your words. Open our eyes to see your ways. And open our hearts and minds to know how to respond. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the advent of digital media, emails, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp and all the rest, has to a very great extent sounded the death knell for proper letter writing. Now that we can communicate instantly in response to pretty well anything, there's not much point sitting down with a, a piece of paper and a pen or even a typewriter and dashing off a few paragraphs of properly constructed English. Sally, my wife, is a part of a family WhatsApp group, which I am certainly not, but I did take the opportunity recently of responding to a series of remarks from my children by using Sally's phone, and there were soon comments along the lines of, that was Dad answering, wasn't it? It has proper sentences and punctuation and stuff. People of my generation who learned to read and write before everything was reduced to digital grunts and emojis and abbreviations with no vowels in, a bit like Welsh really, uh, used to write letters when the need arose. And that was mainly when we were kids to thank people for birthday and Christmas presents. And there was usually a, a kind of formula we stuck to. Dear Auntie Olive, then an inquiry about her health, I hope you're well. Then the actual thank you bit, thank you for the postal order for five shillings that you sent me for my birthday. Then something about how you used it, I spent it on a new set of lights for my bike. Then a bit of news of some sort along the lines of we've been enjoying the snow this week. And then the final greeting. Well, that's all for now. Love to you and the cat. All the best from Ian. And most letters, whether they were from a friend, a relative, from the council or the gas board even, followed some sort of pattern even it wasn't quite that one. And these letters from Paul the Apostle to the Christians in the newly planted churches scattered around the eastern Mediterranean region in the first century also follow a bit of a formula, based very much, as we've already seen, on the literary conventions of the time. And in the letter from which Meg has just read to us, that letter to the Christian community in Colossae, which was going to be shared, if you read on towards the end of the letter, going to be shared with the Christian community in Laodicea and probably Hierapolis as well. Paul has introduced himself and his friend Timothy. He has greeted the Colossians. He has expressed his thanks for their faith and witness. 
He set out the main reason for his writing, and as we saw last time, established the letter's focus on the centrality of Jesus Christ. And now, the bit we've read this morning, he includes a couple of paragraphs, as he does somewhere in most of his letters, which are kind of autobiographical, setting out something about his call and his mission. And what you need to remember is that Paul has not yet met the Colossians personally. His friend Epaphras has been doing all the work on his behalf. So in a sense, he's kind of setting out his credentials so that they know he's trustworthy and that they should take what he has to say seriously. And in this particular instance, writing to the Colossians, he writes about his call, his proclamation, his pastoral concern and his purpose in all of this. So we're going to look at those one by one this morning. Firstly, he talks about his call. In uh, verse 25, towards the beginning of that reading, Paul writes, I have become the church's servant by the commission God gave me. By the commission God gave me. Paul has been called by God to the ministry he's in. And wherever you come across Paul talking about his ministry, whether it's in his letters or the accounts of his preaching in the book of Acts, he's eager to point out that God has called him. If you know the story of Paul's conversion and, and call, you can find it in that book of Acts, in Acts chapter 9, you'll be well aware that he certainly did not volunteer for this. And whatever our ministry, and if we're a follower of Jesus Christ, we will have one, be it prayer or preaching or helping others or encouragement or whatever, that ministry is at root a call from God. As Jesus said to his original group of disciples in John chapter 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. And with that call comes all sorts of other stuff, especially in church leadership, and it seems especially in Paul's case. Following Christ is not always an easy path to take. And truly following where God leads us can often be more difficult than we'd envisaged. Answering the call of God is not a route to a comfy life or to fame and fortune. If you want to prove that, just ask any church leader whether they're in it for the money. Paul writes here in, in verse 24 of his suffering. I rejoice in what was suffered for you. Of his struggle in verse 29. To this end I labour struggling with all my energy. And in chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 2, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at, at Laodicea. It can be very tough. And it's that sense of God's call that keeps Paul going and can keep us going too. Being called by God. And as I say, we are all called to some ministry, or other, some expression of our Christian faith that touches the lives of others. Being called is an immense privilege. But even when it's not easy. The idea that God has called us and therefore he will sustain us and resource us is a huge factor. It's not our idea, it's his. So we're not having to make things up, we're not having to think of things to do, we're not having to examine our motives or do stuff under our own strength. God is at work in us and cannot be denied. If ever you saw that wonderful sitcom with Tom Hollander called Rev, which is one of the best portrayals of Christian ministry you'll find. You may recall an amazing scene. It was on the, the, the balcony, the walkway of a, a, a tower block, where the, the vicar, Adam Smallbone, played by Tom Hollander, is struggling with what to do in a particular situation, whether he wants to go ahead with it, how it fits in with all that uh, is going on in his life. And he just keeps coming back to this idea that God has called him. He cannot deny or refuse that. Or Robert Duval's 1997 film, The Apostle, you see the same thing. The pastor, played by uh, Duval, called Sonny Dewey, kills the youth minister with whom his wife's been having an affair and ends up on the run. But even while he's hiding from the law, he cannot help himself planting another church. And when he's eventually caught, the final scene showing preaching to his fellow inmates, he cannot negate God's call on his life. And if you protest that that's not a good example, look at Moses, at Jacob, at Samson, at David, at Paul himself. All people who were called by God and used by him despite the far more murky aspects of their lives. 
If God calls you and you respond, he will use you and sustain and help you as he does Paul. So that's his call. And that call is to a specific ministry in Paul's case. And he writes here in uh, that verse we've already quoted from that he's been commissioned to present to you the word of God in all its fullness. He is called to preach, to proclaim the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the word of God in its fullness. And as we read on, we see that Paul regards that as including both admonishing and teaching. He has to warn people when they're going against God's purposes, as well as pointing them towards the great blessings that are in store for them. But at the heart of it all is this mystery. Mystery we, we've looked at many times before, if you've been following uh, the sermons here over the months and years. Paul is presenting to them, proclaiming to them, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. He's telling them all about this amazing story of God's love that is now fully out in the open, out in the open for the Gentiles as well. It's no longer just the preserve of the Jewish people. And this mystery is a secret that has been revealed. And at the heart of it are the two phrases that, that Paul uses here. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's those last two phrases that are the key. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you expresses that, that idea of reconciliation that we looked at last week, if you were following. In Jesus Christ, through his life and death and resurrection and glorification, we are now reconciled with God. We are back where God intended us to be from the very beginning. And the guarantee of that is the sense that we have Jesus living within us, if you like, through his Holy Spirit, Christ in us. As we respond to God's wonderful offer of being put right with him through Jesus, so then we have the assurance that somehow we have his spirit within us, Christ in us, and with that comes the hope of glory. It's great having that assurance for now, but it's an assurance that not only is God with us and helping us here and now, but that we have a great and glorious eternal future to look forward to. A future in God's renewed and restored kingdom. A future that will see a sharing in the glory of the risen and ascended Jesus Christ. The hope of glory. This is what Paul's proclaiming. All that he says and all that he does is directed towards this astonishing truth. When Jesus calls us and we respond, we can know his help and his presence now. A renewed attitude to our lives here and now. A renewed attitude to God's world. A renewed attitude to each other. A renewed relationship with God, all sustained and nourished by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we can know a wonderful hope for the eternal future, which means you don't have to worry now about what's going to happen to us then when this life is over. Is that amazing or what? That's what Paul is proclaiming. That leads us, or leads him in his writing here, into the next point. Because he expresses here his pastoral concern for the Colossians. His pastoral concern. And having this concern for other, other Christians isn't about visiting them in hospital or holding their hands when life's crises arrive. That is, of course, part of it. But Paul actually can't do all that kind of thing from the prison where he's writing this letter. What he can do, though, is keep proclaiming Jesus and his love so that, as he says here, he may present everyone fully mature or perfect in Christ. His aim is to help his readers become what they were meant to be, or indeed become what they are once Jesus has touched their lives. He wants them to realise in every sense what Jesus has done for them how it can have an impact on their lives and how they can ensure that they hang on to that. That's his pastoral concern. He wants the best for them. And we all have a part to play in that, once again. It's not just down to the one who actually has the title, pastor, but to each and every one of us as we pray for each other, support each other, speak with each other, weep with each other, laugh with each other, share with each other. Together we're called to help each other keep growing as disciples of Jesus. 
Now, Paul doesn't say that specifically here, um, just so no one accuses me of adding things to the text. But he does say it in plenty of other places elsewhere. So let's ensure that together we do all that we can to make that happen in our own situation, that we, we show that concern for one another as people who are called by Jesus. And then finally, Paul says there was a reason for all of this, the purpose behind it. This purpose in his ministry, the, the reason for the exercise of his call, for the preaching and teaching he's doing, for the pastoral concern that he has for them. He says, it's in chapter 2 and verse 2, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. They should be encouraged in heart and united in love. He wants particularly to stand alongside them to strengthen them, to build them up through his teaching and preaching and, and through the struggle that he's experiencing on their behalf. This word here that's translated encourage is the Greek word paraklithosin, which uh, comes from the same root as paraclete, which is a kind of word sometimes used to describe the Holy Spirit, the comforter. It's from, from a, a Greek word meaning to stand alongside. The comforter, the one who stands alongside us to support us and offer help. Paul wants his readers to be encouraged, comforted, strengthened in their faith. This word encompasses all those different meanings. And for that to happen throughout the company of God's people, they need to be united in love. It always comes back to this in Paul's letters, doesn't it? It always comes back to this in the teaching of Jesus. We quoted from John 15 earlier on about being chosen by God, And that little section goes on there in, in John chapter 15, this is verses 16 and 17. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Jesus' command, love each other. As followers of Jesus who have heard the secret, the mystery that's been revealed about God's plans for us, who've been called to live out that mystery in our lives day by day, we need to demonstrate that first and foremost in our love for each other. Paul is desperate for that to happen in all the churches to which he writes. You'll find that if you look through all his letters. Because uh, the old Scottish scholar William Barclay writes uh, along these lines, without love... There is no real church. Methods of church government and ritual are not what matters. And indeed, as we've seen in this pandemic, buildings as well. These things change from time to time and place to place. The one mark which distinguishes a true church is love for God and for the brethren. And indeed, the sisters. When love dies, the church dies. And all of that, as we've said, is so that we may know the mystery of God. We might experience that union with Christ and hold on to that hope of glory. The Colossians need to know, as he says here, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, Paul's using the buzzwords of the false teachers there, treasures of wisdom and knowledge, the, the philosophers, the Gnostic teachers and so on. He's saying they need to hang on to what they've got, so they're not deceived by fine-sounding arguments. Which brings Paul back, really, to the reason for writing this letter and where he's going to go on to now. He's writing this to help them counter the ideas that would remove Jesus from the preeminent place at the heart of their faith. And as I say, that's where he's going next, and that's what we're going to look at next time. But in the meantime, let's be encouraged, strengthened, comforted, by the knowledge that we're called by God and he will never let us go. Then let's express that in our love for one another and in the way we help one another to grow and bear further fruit with Jesus at the very centre of all that we do as a church at the heart of the city with Christ at the heart of the church. One way that we have of supporting, encouraging one another is to pray. And Andrew Rushton is at home in Norwich, close, ready to lead us in our prayers this morning as we think not only of each other here in Litchfield, but of the wider world and its needs. So over to you, Andrew. Look at this snow. It's all bright and clean. 
and it covers any mud and weeds. And love covers a multitude of sins. We've heard that we should love one another and we're encouraged that we are knit together in love. And in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, God says to you and me, Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And again, though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And we're going to pray now. And when we're praying, I'm going to be saying, um, Lord, in your mercy, and then you can join him. Uh, with grant us this prayer or receive our prayer that kind of thing so let's pray thank you God that you love us totally you love us completely and you love us unconditionally help us by the power of you, God, Holy Spirit, to share this with each other and all those who we meet, virtually or face to face. And we pray for our world. We pray for the COVID to, to go, the vaccines to be freely available, put it in people's minds and hearts to, to follow the regulations and the guidelines and the rules so that we may all stay safe and love one another. And we pray in this time for the, your love to be shed abroad and the gospel to reach into people's hearts and minds and for transformation because we know, Lord, that you are weeping for your world. And we pray for our nation. Again, we pray for all the work that is being done to help um, get rid of this awful disease. And we pray for our leaders to work together, for the Prime Minister and his cabinet and the opposition people to take us forward. Pray that your Holy Spirit would work through all people there, all leaders. And again, we pray for the, um, the gospel to be spread throughout our country and people to turn to you. And we pray for Litchfield and its leaders. And we thank you. Well, we thank you for the, the work of the NHS and we pray for their protection, the work of teachers in schools and we pray for their protection. Pray for children learning. And we pray for the leaders in Litchfield as they organise the vaccinations and the various different testings and, and all those things. And we pray and thank you for, for your church in Litchfield churches together, to work together, to be knit together in love and so that we may spread the good news that you are, are alive and that you bring forgiveness and peace and we pray that that would, that, that the gospel would be spread here. We think particularly at the moment about the Litchfield Christian Schools Work Trust and the various strands of that, the puppies the schools weeks, the mentoring, the bridge building. And we thank you for all those things and we pray that you would work through them and bless this work with the creation of relationships with young people and with teaching staff. Help us to help, help this work to be supportive of all that's going on in the schools in Litchfield primary and secondary. And we pray for Tina and Rick and all the committee that you would bless them and lead them and guide them and we thank you for them and we pray for our streets our neighbours um, 
to come to know you. And we pray and we thank you for this idea of witnessing and, and walking and having the, the emblem of the, or the, the logo of the church. And uh, we pray that that would bring forth fruit. And we pray for your church here, uh, for healing. And for all those watching online who, who have just started coming to the church, whether they be down in Cornwall or up in the north of Scotland and all places in between. Pray for your touch in their lives. We pray for those who are grieving, uh, lost, uh, have lost people. And particularly we think about uh, Sandra Turley at this moment in time. And we pray for healing as well for those in our midst who um, are struggling with maybe mental health or physical things and f uh, physical difficulties. And we pray for Christine Butch and all her family. And we ask that Lord, in your mercy, you will hear our prayer. Let's just have a moment of quiet to put a few prayers of our own. And we pray all these prayers in and through the name of Jesus Christ for his glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks very much, Andrew, for, for those prayers. So a final song now as we're led once again uh, by the Tranchants. It's a, a song based on the experiences of the Old Testament prophets Elijah and Ezekiel as they look forward to God's activity. These are the days of Elijah. Servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare me the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. And these are the days of Ezekiel. There is no God like Jehovah. 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 There is
thank you once again, uh, Sam and Mark, for leading us in that song, and indeed for all your input in this morning's worship. And uh, thanks, as always, to uh, James and Colin of Jacob Productions, uh, together with their new assistant, I think he's called The Best Boy or something like that in the credits, um, Steve, who uh, have filmed and edited uh, this morning's service. Uh, please keep, as I said earlier on, sending in your photos and videos and messages and so on for inclusion in the service. That's one way that we have of encouraging one another. And let us know too of any celebrations that are coming up. Uh, a lot of the regular activities of the church mostly online, house groups, prayer groups, and all that kind of stuff, children's and young people's activities. Uh, are, they're still going on. You can find details of them on our church website uh, or on Instagram um, by using the contact details that will be on the screen at the end of this service. Uh, if you want to get involved in walking around the city as you exercise uh, each day, and you'd like to spot the homes of other people from the church, uh, don't forget to look out for the church logos on people's windows. There are details on the uh, uh, Wade Street Church social Facebook page. And if you're a church member, please uh, note that there's a church meeting via Zoom on Thursday the 11th of February at 7.45. But now, some final words of prayer. Lord, send us forth into this week, encouraged in our hearts, united in your love, and ready to offer glimpses of your kingdom in all that we say and all that we do. And now may the peace of the Lord go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all this day, this week and forevermore. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us uh, once again this morning. It's good to know that there are some people out there watching this. Uh, we hope you have a good week and that you're able to join us again next time. Goodbye. Suffocating slowly in a stranger's house Fighting just to breathe here and I'm choking on doubt And I know I gotta call you oh, Cause what I need now is your love Your